Well, I'd like to invite you to take a copy of the scriptures and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, where we'll, con we'll continue uh, in our series of messages uh, from Mark's Gospel as we take a look at uh, the life and, uh, of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he came to do. I'll be reading from Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. So I invite you to follow along in a copy of God's Word with me. Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. And then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing him, he fell at Jesus' feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And Jesus went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much. Under, the, under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet, yet you say, Who touched my garments? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha, kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this. And he told them to give her something to eat. Let's pray together. Father, this is your word. It is living and active. It is powerful for uh, the transformation of our lives and for the salvation of our souls. And so, Lord, we ask now that you would send your Holy Spirit now to the, not just to the reading, but to the hearing and teaching of your word and to our hearts that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of our Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we might also be changed more and more into his image. Father, grant us faith this morning to believe and to trust in your Son, Jesus Christ, and in your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the first verse of the Gospel of Mark tells us that this is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the rest of Mark's Gospel gives powerful testimony to that reality as he chronicles event after event in the life and ministry of Jesus that reveal Jesus' identity as God's beloved Son and his mission as God's anointed ruler and redeemer of his people. And at the end of chapter 4 and, and in chapter 5, Mark records for us four miracles of Jesus that point to his divine power and his authority over all things. We saw a couple of weeks ago his power and authority over the material forces of nature as he calms the hurricane-like force of a terrible storm on the Sea of Galilee that threatened the lives of his disciples. 
We also saw his power and authority over the spiritual forces of evil as he cast out a legion of demons from a tormented soul on the other side of the lake. And today we see that Jesus is also Lord over the realm of sickness and death as he heals a woman from a long-term illness and he raises a little girl from the dead. And as you read these accounts in the life of Jesus, you realize that, that these are the days in which we live. Days in which the threats and sufferings, the pain and uncertainty and hopelessness, the despair of life in an incredibly hard and broken world come at us from all directions. Literal storms sweep unexpectedly through communities, wreaking havoc and, and leaving behind a swath of destruction. People ensnared by fear, anxiety, desperation, abuse, injustice of various kinds and to different degrees. The constant threat and the devastating impact to our health and well-being from disease or other unexpected, uncontrollable circumstances. And of course, there's the inevitable encounter with mortality and death that we all face. And here in Mark 5, we find two stories within one that we might read in any morning headline today. Or perhaps some of you have or will experience in your own life or maybe in the life of someone you love. A father facing the death of his little girl and there's not a thing he can do. I mean, this is, this is not how it's supposed to be. Parents aren't supposed to bury their children and you can sense the, the desperation and despair he must feel. And then a poor woman facing a chronic illness uh, that impacts every element of her life and, and despite countless and effective, in, uh, expensive treatments, it has only gotten worse and left her feeling hopeless and alone. And this is not just the world of Jesus' day, but it's the world in which we live. It's the world, as author Paul Tripp says, where faith is a war. We are confronted with the question day in and day out, are we going to believe the radical claims of Jesus? Do we have faith in God's power and his promise to care and comfort and contend for us no matter what? Will we look to Jesus Christ alone as our only hope in a world that is marked by suffering and death? I mean, Mark records these two incidents that are, that are intertwined with one another with an emphasis, emphasis not just on the, the person and the power of Jesus to bring peace, restoration, healing, and life, but on the instrument by which his calming, restoring, healing, life-giving power is manifested in our lives, and that is through faith. I mean, these two miracles are not just about Jesus' power, but about the, the response of faith that comes when we believe in Jesus Christ. And as we come to God's Play, this place in God's word, to this encounter with God's son at, our time, at a time in our lives and our culture where faith may seem like a real battle right now, Jesus' encouraging words to Jairus echo in our ear. Do not fear, only believe. So let us look at, at God's word here and be strengthened in our faith. As we look at, at faith in these two encounters with Jesus that really make up one overall event, we see two different people brought to the same point. And then we see two different approaches that brings them to the same person. And lastly, we see two different miracles that bring about the same result. That's going to be the outline that we follow. First, we're introduced to two different people who are brought by different circumstances to the same point in their lives, a point of desperation. And the contrast between the reception of Jesus on the other side of the lake and, and that here as he returns to Capernaum is evident from the very beginning. There he was met by a, a demon-possessed man who falls at his feet and begs Jesus to leave him alone. And the town folks there begged him to leave. But here the crowds once again press in to see him and a man named Jairus comes and falls at his feet and begs Jesus to come to his house. Now Jairus was an important man in town. He was one of the rulers of the synagogue. He was a, a, a well-respected uh, religious leader in the community. 
Perhaps it was at the synagogue that he first became acquainted with, with Jesus and his teaching. Certainly he had heard of and maybe even witnessed Jesus' healing ministry in the community. And no doubt he was well aware of the controversy and the conflict that had arisen between the Pharisees and Jesus at this point. Indeed, for, for Jairus to come to Jesus and to give any credence or approval to his ministry would have put himself and his reputation at risk. To seek out Jesus meant that Jairus would likely face the ire, face the rebuke of his religious colleagues and perhaps even lose his position as a, a lay leader in the synagogue. Some of you may know what that's like. But for Jairus, his need far outweighed the risk. For we learn that his, his only child, his 12-year-old daughter, is lying sick on her deathbed. And it appears that there's no hope for her. I remember being in the hospital with one of our sons when he was only a, a few weeks old and he had contracted a, a virus. And there his, his little body was with IV tubes and monitor wires everywhere and he was laboring to breathe. And, and, and I remember as, as new parents, uh, just the desperate feeling of wondering if he was going to make it or not. As a dad, it was heart-wrenching to see my little boy suffering and to, to think about losing him. Well, Jairus did not have the benefit of modern medicine, and his daughter's hope of recovery seems all but gone, and she's, she's lying on her deathbed. And so seeing Jesus, Jairus comes to him in desperation, and he falls at his feet, and he pleads for Jesus to come and lay his hands on her so she might be healed and live. And take Take notice of Jesus' response. He doesn't ask diagnostic questions. No, get in line or, or, or make an appointment, Jairus. I mean, this is the Lord. This is the divine Son of God. And he's got crowds of people with needs pushing in on him. And Mark tells us almost matter-of-factly that Jesus went with him. How Jairus' hopes must have been lifted even a bit. And friends, don't ever think that God is, is too busy or he doesn't care about what's happening in your life. And so Jesus and, and his disciples in the crowd go, and along the way, we meet another person in the crowd, and it's a woman, much different than Jairus. We're not given her name, but we're given lots of details about her condition. She had been subject to bleeding probably some type of, of menstrual hemorrhaging that had plagued her for 12 years. It had taken a great toll on her physically, personally, socially. She had endured much suffering, Mark tells us. She had seen many doctors and they had tried all kinds of treatments and, and she had spent all of her money and not only had things not improved, but they had gotten worse. There are some of you, or perhaps someone you know, who, who knows what this feels like. You suffer from some condition, maybe chronic headaches, maybe an undiagnosed ongoing pain or other physical ailment. You've, you've tried everything. You've been to numerous specialists. You've taken different medications. You've undergone different procedures. And the medical bills have piled up until finally you don't think you can pay them anymore. And the condition seems to have, have only worsened. Well, that's this woman's situation. And on top of that, her condition would have rendered her unclean according to the, the Levitical law of God. And she would have been prevented from worshiping or even socializing with others. She had been forced to socially distance, not for a few weeks, but for over a decade. Now, we don't know, but if she had a husband, it's likely he's no longer around. If you think about it, maybe it's been years since this woman has experienced the tender, loving touch or, or contact of another person. She was an outcast in many ways. And so for her to come to Jesus, to seek to touch him, it would have, it would have been a risk for her, a risk of further rebuke and rejection from the people in the community and maybe even 
from Jesus himself. But like Jairus, this woman's need outweighed the risk. And so she too, hearing about Jesus, she comes to him. And in desperation, seeking to, to simply just touch the hem of his garment in hopes that that would heal her, she comes. And also like, like, G, like Jairus, Jesus stops what he's doing and he responds to her need. Two very different people. One morally upright, well-respected, upstanding church leader who's facing the, the death of his child. And the other, a, a poor, sick, ostracized woman suffering at the hands of a terrible disease in an unaccepting society. Both are brought by different circumstances to the same point in life, a point of desperation, a place of great need where the, the world can, can no longer offer any hope. And, and think about it like this. Here's Jairus, who had, had something dear to him for 12 years that he is now threatened with losing. His only child, a precious daughter whom he loves and cherishes and who, who he, he looks and longs to see her grow up and, <clears throat> and get married and become a mother. Only now she's on the verge of death and he desperately, desperately wants to hold on to her. And on the other hand, there's this, this woman who has had something as well for 12 years that she desperately wants to get rid of, a life of sickness, pain, poverty, rejection and isolation. But for both of them, for Jairus and this woman, the problem is the same. They have a, a need for which the world offers no hope, no help, no remedy. And they are desperate to find hope somewhere. And you see, for, for all of us, no matter who you are, no matter what your status in life is, there are things that you desperately want to hold on to. It's your family, your marriage, your children, your job, your possessions, your reputation, your health. And likewise, there are things that we desperately want to get rid of. We desperately want to avoid a painful situation, poverty, rejection, illness, and ultimately death. But in life, in this life, there are no guarantees. The world offers no ultimate hope of either holding on to things that we value or avoiding those things that we wish to be rid of. Death comes for the young child. Illness strikes the healthy wife. A pink slip is given to the, to the faithful employee. Graduation or, or a successful athletic season are suddenly canceled and taken away. A tornado rips through a neighborhood. A pandemic spreads through the world. At some point, we are likely to find ourselves like Jairus or like this woman at a point of desperation. And the truth is, for all of us, that is true spiritually. People don't seek out Jesus because everything is rosy. Everything is going well in their lives. They might be like the crowd. We might have heard some cool things about Jesus and come to see what he's all about. Might be hanging around to see just what he might do for them. But if we're to seek Jesus in faith, we have to realize how desperate our situation truly is. We long for true love. We long for meaning and acceptance and security and provision. We long for eternal life. Things that the world cannot ultimately fulfill for us. And we also see that we're plagued by power and pain and the guilt of sin and its ultimate impact, which is death, spiritual death apart from God. And the cure and the solutions that we seek from this wor world don't work. In the end, they often make things worse. And so we need to admit our desperate spiritual condition. And we need to see that it far outweighs the risk and the cost in coming to Jesus, the only one who can offer any help or hope in our situation. And so two different people at the same point come with, with two different circumstances, two different approaches to the same person, and that is Jesus Christ. Jairus, seeing Jesus on the shore, he comes 
directly to him and he falls at his feet and he, he makes, ne- makes no bones about his need. He pleads with him to come with him to his daughter's bedside. And his approach is rooted in faith as he believes that Jesus' touch is what is needed to heal her. The woman takes a different approach. She seeks discretion. She comes up behind Jesus, stealthily making her way through the crowd, hoping to go unnoticed and to simply touch the hem of his garment. And her approach is also rooted in faith. She believes such a touch is all that's needed to heal her. Now, a couple things to notice. First, notice that both had faith, but it wasn't blind faith. Their faith was rooted in specific information about a specific person. Both Jairus and this woman had undoubtedly heard and probably even seen Jesus' healing power. And their, their faith is based on what they know about him. You see, faith is not, is not blind faith. It's not just faith in something. Faith itself is not magical. It's not just believe in something, believe in yourself, and things will go well. Faith is only as reliable as the object of that faith. And Paul tells us in Roman that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And so biblical Christian faith is rooted in the historical, testified to reality of who Jesus is and what he has said and what he has done. You see, we don't just believe in something. We believe in someone whom we, we see and we hear and we know through the testimony of the Gospels and through God's word. And so they come not with just blind faith. But second, notice that their faith is not perfect faith. In some ways, Jairus uh, has what we might call a foxhole faith. He's at the end of his rope. There's nowhere else to turn. His daughter lays dying, and this is, this is his last hope. And so he comes desperately to Jesus. What must he have thought when Jesus stopped to, to look for this woman in the crowd? You can imagine him thinking, are you serious, Lord? You're going you're gonna to stop now my, while my little girl is dying and try to find someone in this, in this great crowd who just reached out and touched you? You see, when the people come with the news that, that his daughter has already died, you can imagine how Jairus' faith is crushed. They say, don't trouble the teacher anymore. She's, she's gone. And I think that's why Jesus says to him, don't fear, only believe. Don't lose faith, Jairus. Keep believing, keep trusting in me. And the woman's faith was what we might call a superstitious faith. She comes thinking, if I can just get close enough, if I can just touch the clothes on his back, maybe some of his healing power will rub off on me. But even though their approach is different and their faith is imperfect, it brings them to the same person, Jesus. It's not the amount of faith you have. It's not the depth of that faith. It's not how much you believe or how strong you you believe it but it's the person you believe in that matters. It's not how you come, but to whom you come that makes the difference. And this is seen in Jesus' response to the woman once she identifies herself and explains why she touched him. Again, Jesus doesn't give her a, a doctrinal lecture or explain the dangers of syncretism or silly superstitions. He simply says, daughter, your faith has made you well. It wasn't some magical formula, but her trust in the power of Jesus, enough to to come in hopes of just touching him. And she is healed. And then to Jairus, when the news arrives of his daughter's death, Jesus doesn't say, "Oh, oh, if you'd have just believed more, if you'd have come to me a little earlier. No, he simply says, believe, keep trusting me, even when it seems impossible. You see, all kinds of people come to Jesus for all kinds of reasons and with all kinds of different motives. They don't always understand a whole lot, and sometimes their their understanding may be flawed. You might come with a weak faith, 
Lord, I'm full of doubts. I can't, I can't see how this is going to turn out. I don't know why you would even care, but I need you. You might come with a, with a, a foxhole faith. Jesus, I'm in, I'm in dire straits here. I've run out of options. Here I am, and you're all I've got. You might even come with a, a superstitious faith. Lord, I've tried everything. I've lit votive candles. I've, I've given up fast food. I've, I've prayed the Lord's Prayer forward and backwards. What I really need is, is you. Whatever the approach, the important thing is that you come to Jesus in genuine faith. Jesus often rebuked his disciples for their little faith, but he always responded in power and in love for them. What brings us to Jesus is our desperate need, and what, what connects us to Jesus is our trust in who he is and what he has done and what he can do. So two different people come to the same point of desperation, and two different approaches lead them to the same person, the Lord Jesus. And then we see two different miracles lead to the same results, and that is new life. For the woman, her touch of, of Jesus's garment brought about an unexpected response. Her faith was proved true. When she touched his cloak, immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could, she could tell right away that she had been healed. But what she didn't expect was that Jesus would notice. But but something happens that's important for us to understand. Jesus, not knowing who had, who had touched him, he realizes that, that something has happened. A power has gone out of him. A transaction of sort has taken place, and he, he stops and he asks, who touched my garments? Now, you can understand the disciples think he has to be joking. They're a little cynical. They say, you know, come on, Jesus, don't you see the crowds? <laughs> I mean, maybe the better question here is, is who hasn't touched you? But Jesus is not dissuaded. He keeps searching until this woman, sensing his, his penetrating gaze, she comes trembling in fear at what, what he might do or what he might say next. And she falls down at his feet and she tells him the whole story. And I think there's a great picture here of of what would take place in Jesus' own suffering and death on the cross. You see, the woman is healed before Jesus even says anything. An exchange of sort takes place here in which Jesus feels, feels the power that flows from him to her. Jesus, in a sense, becomes weak that, that she might become strong. He bears in his body her weakness, her uncleanness. And from him, she is made whole and, and declared clean. And that's why Jesus stops to identify her. He wants her to know. He wants the, the all who are, who are there around them to know what has happened. And so he says to her tenderly, Daughter, your faith has made you well. You are clean. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. I mean, think about how those words sunk deeply into her heart and, and life. When, when do you think was the last time that she heard someone call her daughter? And now Jesus, whose life has, has restored her life, speaks of her as family and he declares before all the crowd, she is restored, she is clean. And then there's Jairus. During all of this, the, the news that arrives is that his little girl is dead and, and, and no need to bring Jesus now. It's a done deal. But Jesus encourages him. He says, don't worry. Trust me. And Jesus takes only Peter and James and John and he goes to the house and, and there he meets this group of mourners weeping and wailing. And, and it was customary then to, to hire professionals who would come to the funeral, who would who would uh, express the grief and the mourning through weeping like this. And Jesus comes and he hears this commotion going on and he says to them, he says, why, why are you making all this racket? Don't you know that, that the child is not dead, she's sleeping? And again, their response is somewhat cynical. The mourners quickly become mockers and they start laughing at Jesus. 
And they say, look, man, we know a dead body when we see one. We know she is dead. That's, that's what we do. And she was dead. Jesus speaks of her death as sleep because of what he was about to do. And so, so he leaves them outside and he goes with, with Jairus and with his wife and with Peter, James, and John into the little girl's room and he sits down by her bedside and, and you can almost see Jesus now running his hands through her hair. He reaches down and he grabs her hand and he says to her very tenderly, Talitha, kumi, which in the Aramaic means arise, little girl, get up. No great display of incantations, no applying ointments or, or healing lotions, simply a word. Sweetheart, it's time to get up, as if he's waking her up from a good night's sleep. And immediately she got up and began walking. And, and then, it's amazing, Jesus doesn't stop caring for her. He says to the people who are probably staring in, in disbelief and, and wonder, he's like, what are you doing? Go ahead, get her something to eat. She's hungry. Feed this little girl. Two miracles. One in response to an unsuspecting touch of faith from a desperate woman racked with disease. The other a, re a response to the wavering faith of a, of a desperate father whose daughter is dead. Both lead to the same result. To the power of life. To restoration. To healing to the wholeness that only God can give and that comes through Jesus for this woman and for this little girl and her father. To those who believe. Both are healed. Both receive the gift of new life. Both are made physically and uh, whole and restored to relationships. One with the community and the other with her parents. The word for healed in this passage is the same as the Greek word for saved. And the salvation from, from physical suffering and death which, which Jesus brings here in these two situations, it serves as a visible, tangible manifestation of the spiritual peace, the spiritual healing, the spiritual restoration and life which he would achieve through another great transaction that took place on the cross. There he would pour out his own blood. There he would, he would breathe out his last breath unto death so that you and I could be healed, so that you and I could be given new life through his power at work in us by faith. You see, Jesus died and rose again that we, he might say to all who see their desperate need, to all who come to him in faith and hear of his work in the gospel and believe in him, that he might say, daughter, son, little child, arise. You have been healed. Get up. You have new life. Go and live it in peace. Friends, Jesus can save anybody from anything. He has power and authority over nature, over evil, over sickness, and even over death. Jesus has conquered them all through his life and his death and his resurrection from the grave. And he continues to exercise that saving, restoring, life-giving power on behalf of any and all. Who, who reaching and recognizing the point of, of desperation and their desperate need for God's mercy and grace, who come to him in faith, who trust in, in Jesus as their only hope of being saved from sin and death and being restored to relationship and new life with God for eternity. Do you believe Jesus can save anybody? Do you believe that Jesus can save you. Jesus does not turn away from anyone who comes to him in humble, sincere faith. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter what your background is. Come to Jesus. Run 
to Jesus. Fall at the feet of Jesus. Jesus can be trusted with all your sin. He can be trusted with all your fears, with your failures. He can be trusted with your pain, with your struggles, with your disappointments. He can be trusted with your despair, even with your life. Your faith may be weak. It may be a, a waning, draining faith. It may be the, the size of a, a little mustard seed, barely even discernible. But if it's faith in Jesus, if it's faith in the, the Son of God and the Savior of sinners, if you look to him confessing your need, acknowledging his power, accepting his sacrifice, trusting in his grace, that he will take away your sin. He will give you new life. And he will care for you in, in every little detail and in every way as one of his own child of the living God. And so I just ask you, what is, what's challenging your faith right now? Where are you at, at war to believe in God? What is, what is it in this, in this current situation or current crisis that's especially rocking your world right now? Are you coming to Jesus? Are you believing and trusting in what only he can do? Bring peace, bring healing, Bring hope. Bring new life. Don't fear. Only believe and trust in Jesus. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we come to you from different backgrounds, different circumstances, with different trials and struggles and needs in our life, but all of us come, Lord, to the same point, to the point of desperation. And Father, we deeply, deeply need you. And so we come as well to the one person, to the, to the one place where we can find true hope, true healing, true forgiveness in life, and that is to your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you that you came and entered our world, that you came and, and, and took upon yourself human flesh and walked in our shoes and that you died on the cross for our sins and rose from the grave that we might know life, true life, eternal life. And so, Lord, we come and we ask, wherever we are right now, that we, Father, you would take our our faith, our little faith, as weak as it is, and that you would, Father, fill it with your power, and that you would pour out that power in our lives and enable us, Lord, to know that we are forgiven, that we are free, that nothing that we face right now, Father, can, can keep us from your great love. And Father, I pray for, for those right now who may uh, be in a place of desperation, and not knowing what to do, and, and maybe having never understood that your son Jesus came to give true hope and healing and life. And I pray, Father, that you would give them faith right now to confess their need and to turn to you. And Father, for all of us, help us to be a people of faith in this time when we are separated, we are isolated from one another. Lord, help us to remember that nothing keeps us from you and that you are present and here with us as your children. And we just give you thanks for that and pray for your grace in our time of need. In Jesus' name, amen.